Thank you, Mary. And uh, I just want to thank uh, the Academy of American Poets, which is really a, a terrific organization, and this is a great event. And um, I'm honored to be part of the, the, first, the first event of Poets Forum, I guess, unless you count the chancellor's reading last night. Um, but I kind of figure this is like the future chancellor's event, you know. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, as, as part of my job, can everybody hear me okay? Should I speak up a little bit? Okay. So as, as part of my job, I'm required to read and edit a lot of news and articles and interviews uh, about the state of publishing in America. You know, editors and agents and, and heads of traditional publishing houses are all dealing with a rapidly changing uh, landscape. Um, you know, advances in technology, changing reading habits, uh, and sadly the closing of a lot of bookstores. Um, they're all dealing with that. And uh, depending on who you talk to or who you're reading uh, and when, uh, it can seem like a really complicated and kind of grim state of affairs. Uh, of course, you know, there's one group these editors, agents, and heads of publishing houses hardly ever mention, right? And that's poets. So I think one way to look at that is that they don't mention poets simply because poets don't produce the products that uh, typically, you know, register in the commercial publishing houses' profit and loss sheets, right? Okay. Um, you know, if anyone is coming to poetry to make a whole bunch of money, we should probably be having a really different conversation, right? Um, so, uh, uh, you know, another way to look at it, though, is that editors and agents and heads of publishing houses don't mention poets these days because poets are remarkably free from that system that, depending on, how, on who you talk to, isn't working out so well these days, right? Poets have so many options, and I want to talk about some of those options uh, today. Um, you know, because we, sh we should really just uh, uh, celebrate the fact that we have so many options to get our work in front of readers. But first, I think it's, it's worth pausing just to think about why we poets want to get published. It seems like a really simple question, right? Um, I, you know, it's validation, certainly, and we shouldn't downplay the, the importance of validation in a poet's life. We all need that. Um, but I think the real reason we want to be published is so, so people read our work, right? We want to be part of the conversation. We want to share the, our brilliant take on life and poetry, and we want to, we want to be in there. Um, so, you know, I think that's important to remember. Um, the goal, you know, shouldn't necessarily be to be published by the journals or the presses that pay the most. Again, good luck with that. Um, and it shouldn't necessarily be to uh, be published by the journals and presses that are the coolest or that are the easiest to get into, right? It should really be uh, to appear in a place or in a format um, that is going to get your work in front of the most readers, or at least the right readers, the readers that you want to see your work. I also think, you know, the place that, that poets have to start when thinking about publishing is, is with the work itself. And that, that, too, can seem like kind of a really simple thing, and it's a little cliche, like we all hear it, right? Before thinking about publishing, you've got to think about the work itself and make sure that the work is, is what it should be. And that's totally accurate, and that's totally right, uh, but that's not exactly what I mean. What, what I mean is that I think that, you know, before anything, we should focus on the work of other people, you know? Um, it, when you're when you're looking at a literary magazine and you're reading that poem that really speaks to you and you just you just love that poem, you know, make a note about which magazine that was published in. You know, if if you loved that poem, and if the magazine loved that poem enough to publish it, well, you might be able to connect the dots and maybe that magazine will love your work. You know, if you loved the work of that poet so much, so that that's something to think about. And also, you know, uh, when you read the book of your favorite poet, um, after you're done reading the poems, you know, flip to the acknowledgement section and um, take a look at all the magazines that, that, that those poems first appeared in. And, you know, don't just quickly go to the, uh, the submission guidelines on their websites and fire off your poems. What you want to do is you really want to find those magazines and read those magazines and buy those magazines and even subscribe to those magazines. That's not only like a really smart way to identify magazines that, 
you know, uh, may or may not fit with your aesthetic, but it's also a way of supporting the community that you want to be a part of, a part of. And that's just, you know, a, a good way to be a, a good literary citizen, really. Um, so support the community that you want to be a part of. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about a few things, and I'm going to pause in between and ask for any questions. And I really encourage anyone to ask any questions, so I want to I don't want to listen to my voice the entire time, and I want to hear from you guys too. So, um, but to start, uh, literary magazines uh, online and in print are a great first step in developing a readership and beginning the publishing experience. Uh, the literary magazines database at pw.org, which is the uh, website of poets and writers, uh, contains information about 943 journals. So I, I included a screenshot from the opening page of that database just so you can see the format and um, the, the URL is at the top. Um, so 943 journals and 869 of those publish poetry. So there's a, there's a tremendous number of, of potential venues for your work out there. Um, you know, we all the, know the big names like Poetry Magazine and the New England Review and the Southern Review and good Lord, even the New Yorker, right? Um, but the great thing about the world of literary magazines is that there are new ones seemingly every day. I mean, that 943 number is, is changing. It's constantly going up. New ones are coming on the scene. You know, sadly, old ones, uh, you know, can, can die out too. But that's really the sign of like a really healthy ecosystem, right? Um, you know, the old ones die out, the new ones come on. And I just feel like it's a really, I just get excited about the world of literary magazines because it's, um, it's constantly refreshed, and uh, I just feel like they really change according to the state of American poetry. Um, so the new ones are great, but keep in mind that, um, you know, you want to make sure that they're going to be around long enough uh, to really get your work in front of, of readers. Um, you want to consider whether the journal has distribution, um, you know, uh, this is obviously especially true for uh, print magazines. Uh, you want to make sure that they have distribution, a way to get their magazine to the newsstand or the bookstore or subscribers. Uh, because if they don't, your book is going to be printed, but it's not actually going to be, you know, finding its way to in front of people. Uh, for online journals, you know, obviously distribution isn't really the, the point. Uh, but I think that the equivalent for distribution for online journals is you want to make sure that they have some kind of uh, marketing and publicity and promotion muscle behind them, that they have some kind of plan in order to get the word out about their magazine, right? Like uh, print journals have a product to deliver, and online journals have sort of the message of their product to deliver. And I feel like, you know, you can really make a good correlation that both of those are distribution. So you just want to make sure that, you know, um, that the magazine you have your eye on has some way of getting it to readers. Um, so in your handout, uh, I included five tips for submitting your work. Uh, and this was published in the magazine a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's... It's general advice, but I think it's really good advice. Uh, okay, so five tips for submitting your work. You know, the first one, it really alludes to something that I said before. Get the magazine and read it cover to cover. Uh, you know, the, the, the great thing about that, again, is that you're supporting the community you want to be a part of. And also, um, it's going to give you, if you end up, um, submitting to that magazine, if you're really familiar with that magazine, which you should be, otherwise you don't know whether that magazine is right for you or your work, um, but it's going to give you something to say in your cover letter, which is really point two. Uh, you know, you want to write a cover, cover letter that's short and sweet, don't go on and on, but um, I can tell you from experience that a cover letter for, you know, for Poets and Writers magazine is not a literary magazine, but we, you know, publish articles and we, we get a lot of submissions. And the cover letters that at least let me know that they understand what we're trying to do and maybe allude to an article or two in the last couple of issues, it makes a big difference. I at least know that they're, they're sort of serious about, and that this submission hasn't just been sent to all of the, all of the similar magazines. So um, I think that's really important, but you don't also don't want to go on and on and on. So. Um, you know, a uh, sentence or two of biographical information is, is good, um, but again, don't go on and on. 
mentioning other literary magazines that you've been published by um, is also smart. Um, you know, if you submit simultaneously, let the editors know. You know, it used to be that a lot of magazines did not accept simultaneous submissions, and I have a feeling that that's really changing, that, you know, especially with online journals and all of that, there are a lot of magazines that accept that, but you have to make sure that you let the editors know that that's what's happening here. And also, if you get accepted, which you will, right? You'll get accepted. Y you, gotta make, you gotta make sure that immediately you tell the other magazines that you sent that poem to that it's, it's been accepted elsewhere. Thank you. You know, don't be rude about it like, ha ha. <laughs> Someone else published it. Just let them know that it's published and that you look forward to, you know, sending more work uh, and having them consider it because nothing is going to burn a bridge faster than, you know, an editor sending a, a, an acceptance out and having that acceptance actually turn down like, oh, actually two weeks ago this other review uh, accepted my work. So you, you definitely want to be careful about that. Um, you know, it goes without saying, but follow the submission guidelines exactly. Um, you know, by um, doing your research, you're just showing that, that you're a professional, and that's what we should all be striving for here. You know, you want to you comport yourself professionally. Um, and also, in terms of professionally, you know, follow up in a professional manner, too. Um, you know, my experience at Poets Writers, the follow-up, uh, we have reporting times, and we have like a, you know, it takes this amount of time usually to get back to somebody. That doesn't necessarily mean that the day after that expires, you should be, you know, firing off an email or a letter or something and demanding to know what's up with your... You can do it, certainly, but you just want to do it respectfully. And, and keep in mind, with literary journals ex especially, you know, the editorial staff at these places... Th Many times they're not even they're not getting paid. This is a labor of love, and you know they're if it's a good magazine, they're dealing with a tremendous amount of submissions, and um, you just want to be sensitive to that fact. But at the same time, you shouldn't be waiting for a year to hear back from a magazine. So you really have to kind of you know uh, it's a balance between wanting to know and giving them enough time. Um, I th I find that the best the best approach. You know, if you haven't heard back from a magazine and it's way beyond, you know, um, what they said it was going to take for them to get back to you, just follow up with a simple email asking them, you know, just want to make sure that it's still under consideration, things like that. Um, so. Kevin, I have a quick yes. question. Yes. Where do you, where does one um, find out the reporting time? The reporting time should be in the submission guidelines in any magazine now nowadays, almost all of them, 99% of them have a website, and that should be on the website, and it should be part of the submission guidelines. And is it also important to address the letter to the editor, specifically their name, or? I, you know, sometimes they will give you with, you know, in the, um, the address or the email address that they give you, uh, they will designate a, a specific name, but it's always good, rather than like to whom it may concern, that's probably not the way to go, or even dear editor. If you know the editor's name, sure. And you can always find it in the masthead, right? You can always find it in the masthead. And, you know, if you're sending a poetry submission, you know, uh, write it to the poetry editor's name uh, rather than the, the editor or the editor-in-chief. Um, okay, so, yeah, just keep in mind that, you know, writers who are submitting far outnumber the number of editors who are reading the submission, so it takes some time. Um, okay, so, um, you know, another thing to cover is uh, the, the growing number of magazines that charge reading fees or submission fees. Uh, this is something, you know, years ago it would have been considered a complete no-no, and it would have been considered vanity publishing. Um, nowadays it's becoming more and more common. And I think, you know, uh, and there's a... Um, there's actually a piece in the magazine, I didn't include it in the, um, in the handout, but um, it talks about this, about how um, it, it, it links it to the advent of uh, online submission um, processes. Uh, so no longer for a lot of magazines do you have to you know, put the submission in the mail with a self-addressed stamped envelope and pay for postage and get to the mailbox and put it in there and wait and all of that. Nowadays, it's much more common to be able to 
upload your uh, Word document to the online submission manager and simply press submit. So that's good and bad, right? Like you don't have to spend the money in order to do the postal route, but in order to uh, make up for that, um, not in order to make up for that, but on the, on the flip side, you, a lot of magazines are charging uh, a reading fee. And I think that the best thing to do is just to, just to consider if, if it's fair. You know, if it feels right to you, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I mean, it's usually two, three bucks. Um, but it's up to you. It's, you know, it's like the smell test. Like if this seems like it's not, not right and they're doing it to make money, which I don't think they are, um, then don't do it. Uh, but if it's, if it's worth it to you to be able to avoid like doing the printing it out and, and getting the envelope and a self-addressed stamped envelope and the stamps and postage and all of that, then certainly go for it. Um, the other thing about these online submission systems is that uh, the response time is often quicker. You know, you don't have to wait three days for it to actually get there. So it does speed things up a little bit. Hopefully not too much uh, in terms of them considering your work, but um, I don't think so. So um, I think I'd like to turn now to um, contracts and author agreements, right? So. You're going to get your poem accepted by a by a magazine. Um, make sure that you understand what you're getting in return. So I feel like a lot of times, and I know I, for me when I was first starting out submitting to magazines, I wasn't thinking about that at all. I was just like, I just want to be accepted. And it goes back to the validation, right? Um, it never even crossed my mind that you know there would be any payment involved or anything like that. I just wanted to be published. And it was as much to have my work appear in the magazine as to have the editor say, your work is good. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that your work is valuable, right? It's a, it's a piece of art. Um, or as, as most things are considered these days, it's a piece of content, right? And content is really valuable. So it needn't necessarily be money changing hands here. Um, you know, especially, you know, with 943 literary magazines out there, a significant percentage of them are not going to be actually paying you money. But there should be something. You should be getting something more than the privilege of being published in the magazine. Um, it, it can either be contributor copies if it's, not, if it's a print journal. Um, sometimes there will be actual, you know, money. Um, or if it's an online journal, you know, you got to consider whether you being part of, you know, the brand of that magazine is worth enough for you to want to, you know, hand over your piece of art um, for no money. So just keep that in mind. You know, I just, I just think it's really important for poets to really remember that you're creating art and art is really valuable and don't just throw it out there without getting anything in return. Um, so uh, another really important thing to do is make sure that you understand what the literary journal is, is buying from you or requesting from you. It's requesting a poem or a group of poems, but you need to make sure that there is some kind of, f it need not be a formal contract, because I also think that a lot of these, you know, online journals don't have, they don't send you a contract that you sign and send back, but there should be some kind of formal language. Um, that details what exactly the rights are, like what rights they are acquiring from you. And in your handouts, and again, I'm sorry for anybody who doesn't have these, and I'll, I'll send them to you. Um, there's an article by Laura Maylene Walter, The Dotted Line Navigating Literary Magazine Contracts. Um, and that's a really good overview of this, but just, you know, relatively quickly. Um, it used to be when everything was a print journal, we were typically talking about first North American serial rights, right? Um, and that meant that uh, the, the magazine would acquire the rights to uh, print your journal and have, sorry, print your, ma your poem and have your poem appear in their pages the first in North America. No one else could do it first. They were acquiring the first right to do that. Um, Nowadays, it's much more common with online and, you know, nothing is, we're not dealing with just North America anymore, right? So uh, it's much more common now for world rights 
to be on the table. Um, and that kind of sounds grand, but I mean, anything on the internet is being, could potentially be seen by the world, right? So that's, that's world rights. Um, I, you know, the, uh, in terms of Poets and Writers Magazine, the, the rights that we acquire, we acquire um, non-exclusive world rights. And it's for a designated period of time. And that's something that is really important that poets should really pay attention to. When you're, I mean, hopefully the, the editor is gonna send you some kind of formal language about what they're acquiring and when those rights revert back to you. And that's really important. The rights should at some point revert back to you. For Poets Writers Magazine, we acquire the rights for 90 days. And that's essentially the total amount of time that the magazine is gonna be on the newsstand. Um, so that's really important, and I, and I don't think that, that enough poets really consider that. If, you, if there isn't any formal language about when those rights revert back to you, 20 years from now you might want to do something with that poem, and the magazine may still own the rights to it, and you're going to have to deal with that. So it's important to just you know, communicate with the editor or the managing editor, and, and really, um, even if they don't have a formal contract, just just ask them politely for, you know, what exactly are we, are we talking about here? Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, she was saying that uh, she utilizes a service that will go out and um, s uh, submit her work to journals for her. So to do all of the clerical work and all of that. Um, and I didn't get the service, what, Writer's Relief. So Writer's Relief? Yeah, see, the thing is, is that if, uh, I mean, I would hope, I don't know what Writer's Relief does, but I would hope that they are really reading your work very carefully and really, you know, understanding those magazines very carefully. And also, I would be a little, I would be, I'd be curious about what kind of cover letter they're sending and whether it has your signature on it or, yeah, so you write the letter. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. Well, I think I think everybody has to has to you know if it feels right to you, then go for it. You know. Um, but I I just my only caveat would be to make sure that you know what mag because the thing is too that if they find a magazine for you, are you sure that you like that magazine um, and that. Not just like. I mean, it's more about just like. It's it's about, do you agree with the aesthetic of the magazine? Do you agree with how that magazine presents itself to the public? Do you agree with their submission guidelines? Do you agree with if they're running a contest, and we'll get to that later, but if they're running a contest, you agree with how they run that contest, you know? So it's, you know, I feel like... Um, and there's so many magazines, and I think that, that that's why we have services like that. I mean, 943, how are you supposed to r you know, research all of those? It's a lifelong thing, of course. Um, but I, I, think, um, I think it's just important to consider a magazine as more than just a vehicle to get your work to readers. I mean, it is that, certainly, but there's a lot of other parts to it, and I think you need to be comfortable with all of those parts in order to have your name attached to it basically for the rest of your career. Uh, so the, the question is if you have begun publishing your work in sort of uh, lower level, for lack of a better term, literary magazines that maybe not too many people have heard of and you're ready to like raise the game a little bit and go for mid-tier to high level magazines that we've all heard of, is it good to cite those, public, those early publications? Um, I, I think it. I think it depends. I mean, I think that you know, just because the those low-level magazines may not be known by everybody, they could be awesome magazines, you know. And I think that mentioning it in your cover letter is at least going to indicate to the editor of that magazine that there are other people who think that your work is good too, and that's really important, you know. Um, Every editor should want to be the first person to publish you and really be going out there. But, th you know, the fact is, is that it, it doesn't hurt to know that, you know, they may really like your poems. And that, that's the other thing. A cover letter, they might read your poems first and they might really love them and they might be like, gee, I'm not sure. And then they read your cover letter. And knowing that another editor or editors 
have also taken a chance on your work could be the deciding factor. So I would say yes. Um, well, really quick, really quick, okay? Writing contests, um, you know, the grants and awards section of Poets Writers Magazine, if you're familiar with it, I hope you are, lists contests for poets, um, for contests for uh, poetry and literary prose. Um, you know, there's, a, like literary magazines, there are a tremendous amount of writing contests out there, and these are just really great opportunities for people. Uh, a, many of them include publication as part of the award. Um, you know, we're still counting the number of contests and winners we announced in 2013 in the pages of Poets Runners Magazine, but in 2012 we listed 844 poets, writers, and translators, and together they received a total of almost $10 million. Uh, so it's this, it's this in incredibly rich uh, universe of writing contests out there. Um, what you need to understand is what they offer, you know, cash prize, publication, residency, um, all of that. Consider the, the, um, the prize amount or the, the, the publication, what you get from it versus the entry fee. And if it, again, if it feels fair to you, then go for it. For Poets Runners Magazine, we only include um, contests of $1,000 or more if they include an entry fee. The great, if I can just interject, the great sure. thing about Poets and Writers Magazine is that they do screening for you. I mean, any writing contest that appears in the pages of that magazine has already been screened according to their criteria and guidelines, right. so it's a great place to start. Right. So, you know, our, our, the overarching guideline of that is we only list contests that are going to further your career. Um, so $1,000 or more um, or... 500 or more if they don't charge an entry fee but take a look at the entry fees like I've been noticing they, they're starting to starting to creep up a little bit you know um, ten dollars fifteen dollars twenty dollars twenty five dollars but they're starting to get to thirty and you know uh, you, you just have to take a look at the contest and make sure that what they're offering sort of jives with what they're charging you know I mean do the math if they only need 20 submissions in order to make up that cash prize, then something might be a little off, you know? I mean, they do have a lot of expenses and they have to pay the judges and reading the, the readers and, and all of these things. But again, it's sort of the smell test. You just have to just be smart about it and, and do what feels right for you. Um, you know, understand how they're run, uh, make sure that they have adopted some um, code of ethics. You know, this was a big topic uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, and CLMP developed a code of ethics. It's on their website, and I, you know, a lot of uh, writing contests have um, adopted that. And the the gist of it is just that they should have something in place, um, some formal language for, you know, determining who is allowed to enter the contest in terms of whether they know the judge or know the readers or are associated with the magazine or press or anything like that. Um, and also, they should be very transparent about the process. All of this, everybody should be transparent about what they're doing. Um, okay, so in the handout, there's advice from contest editors and, and the smart approach to contest submissions and all of that, and I'll, um, I'll let you guys just read that. And again, I'll send it to you if you don't have it. Um, small presses. Um, okay, so briefly, small presses, you know, the small presses database on pw.org uh, lists information about 310 publishers. 254 of which uh, publish poetry. Um, and again, it's the same thing as literary magazines. I mean, we all know the big names like Copper Canyon and Grey Wolf, and they're doing, and, and Coffee House and Four Way Books and all of those, and they're doing just great work. Um, but there are so many new ones coming up all the time. And um, it's just really important to sort of do the research, read poets and writers for information about new ones. Um, in every issue, we have small press points, which we point out a new, a new publisher. There's new ones added to the database all the time. Um, you know, and, and the thing is, is that they are producing an incredible number of new poetry books every year. And again, you're not gonna hear that when talking to the agents and the editors and the heads of publishing houses that I referred to earlier. But I'm telling you, like, you know, we publish annually a debut poetry roundup in the magazine, um, and, and the, the number of galleys and books that we receive in the office is just, it's really inspiring because there's just so much work. And I know also that Poets House puts on an annual um, Poets Showcase, I think it's called, and those are 
all of the new books that were published in the new year. So I definitely would, would check that out if I were you. Um, publishers, but you know, they should, the, the way that usually that works in terms of like, if you sell this many books, then we'll start paying you. Usually that's built upon an advance, right? So, and that's, those are the things you read about in the newspaper or, or wherever in, in post writers, um, where a, 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 usually a fiction writer or a, or a prose writer will get a book deal and they'll get this massive advance, right? Um, and that's great, and they get a, a portion of the money right away, then they get a portion when they turn the manuscript in, and then they get a portion when the thing's actually published. The publisher then um, doesn't pay any more money to the author until they've, they've earned back that advance, and then they start publishing, then they start giving royalties to the author. But in terms of you know the situation that you're referring to, um, I think there's a lot of different ways to do it, especially in terms of these smaller presses. Um, you should never have to pay. To ha I mean, you can, that's self-publishing, and I was gonna get to that, but I don't think we're gonna have time, but the new issue of Post Writers Magazine is all about it, so. Um, but in terms of like, if, if, if it's not a self-publishing outfit, you shouldn't be paying money to have your book published, you know. Um, so I, I mean, I would say that if it if it feels fair to you, and you if, and the book is what you want it to be, um, I mean, I can't say that no, you shouldn't take that offer. You know, you just really have to weigh what your expectations, and also just make sure that I mean, it sounds like you have a contract. So you need, wanna make sure that you understand all of the rights involved in that contract and what you can do with the work after it's published by them and all of that. Can't stress that enough. If it's important, you have to make it clear, but I will say that you know if you are gonna be giving the rights to a publisher to publish your book, you know it, 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 it varies widely, but you shouldn't assume that you are gonna have the final say on what the cover looks like because it's, it's, it's really not the case. We actually did an article about this some years ago and it was a very contentious debate about, you know, it's my book. Of course I, I'm gonna have final say on what the cover is. And I mean, you know, I have experience in commercial publishing and it's not the case. I mean, you definitely show it to the author and you get their feedback and if they really, really have a problem with it, and they make a compelling case, you can go back and do drafts and things like that. But in the end, it's really the publisher who has the final say on exactly what the cover looks like. So it's something, but you know, not necessarily either. I mean, some of these smaller presses, I know that they want to be collaborative and they're, you know, they will probably take images that you want to use. Um, so it really depends on the publisher, but it's, it's a very important point and you should definitely communicate with them right away, uh, you know, so you know what to expect and how to approach it. And you should look at the books. I mean, some l have to stick with the series and have a certain look, for example. That's right. And, you know, if you don't like the way their books look, that could be a problem, too. Yeah, I mean, I would never say that it's a necessary step, but I do, th I mean, it, it certainly helps. You know, I think that you're building up a list of credits, and it's similar to the, the, the answer for this other question about, um, you know, should you include the previously published, you know, where they were previously published, that's gonna help. Um, in terms of like if you're submitting the, I mean, submitting a manuscript to a, to a contest, you know that it's at least gonna be considered in a way that is probably a little bit more structured than if you just submit the manuscript to a publisher, especially a big publisher. It could never even be seen honestly, you know, um, whereas in a writing contest, I mean, yeah, you're paying the fee, but I, I kind of feel like you're paying that fee for the privilege and the right to have your work seriously considered by, you know, a, a judge that you uh, respect, depending on the contest. But yes, there are some, there are some layers of readers. Um, and, you know, if that's the thing, I mean, I think that it, all, it can all be done simultaneously, you know, um, send your work to literary, I mean, I guess I, you know, personally, I probably wouldn't, if I've never gotten any feedback from an editor at a literary magazine, or never gotten a, 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 maybe a finalist thing at a contest, I probably wouldn't just submit the manuscript just completely cold. I mean, one thing about literary magazines is that, again, you're sort of getting feedback from editors. I mean, if they're just saying no, 
But, you know, there's a lot of good editors out there who will give you feedback on something they're rejecting, too. If they're good, you know, and they have time, I mean, um, they'll give you feedback. So I would say that all of that can be happening simultaneously, you know. It's not something where, and I was going to get to this, um, we didn't get to it, but, uh, you know, keeping track of your submissions, it, you know, I would, I would avoid sending out just a big batch of poems, and I used to do it this way, sending out a big batch of poems and then just sitting there and waiting. And that's when you start to count the days and look at the reporting time like, oh, tomorrow I'm going to be able to send the email saying, where's my response, you know. Um, rather than do that, you know, you can send out a big, a big batch of things, but then when one rejection comes in, you have some other poems to send out right away, and it becomes like sort of a really great, inspiring system that you have. I mean, hopefully it'll be inspiring and it won't just all be rejections, but it won't be. Um, so yeah, I hope that answered your question a little bit. Well, we're past 11.